Hey, everyone, and welcome back to another episode of The Progressive Bitcoiner. I'm your host, Trey Walsh. And today we have on the show my friend, Kent Halliburton. He is the CEO and co-founder of SAS Mining, which is a hosted Bitcoin mining provider using 100% renewable hydropower. So on this episode, of course, we get into Bitcoin mining. We get into, is Bitcoin mining actually good for the environment? We get into running a Bitcoin business and what that's like in this regulatory environment and the landscape of so many different businesses and crypto businesses that so many people have seen and associate with scams and, and frauds and all of these things. What is it like running a, a Bitcoin business that's trying to do things the right way? We get into all of that in this episode. Um, and of course, you all would know of SAS Mining because I've mentioned their promo codes we used before and I've been a customer with them for over a year. So you can check out the promo code in our show notes as well to get $50 off miners with SAS Mining. And we really get into some of the, the technical elements of how does their business run? What is Bitcoin mining like? The relationship with energy, the relationship with Bitcoin and consumerism and how that's actually a net positive for the environment as well. And some of Ken's thoughts, Ken's thoughts on all of this, uh, especially regarding energy. So this is a really great and fun conversation that I hope you all will get a lot of value out of. And I'm trying to do a little bit more playing devil's advocate in some of our conversations, because I'm very mindful that we're heading into an election year. We're heading into crypto becoming a bit more of the mainstream conversation and folks are lumping in Bitcoin and crypto, of course, in general. So trying to really understand someone who might be coming into the podcast listening that doesn't know anything about Bitcoin or a lot of what us progressive Bitcoiners talk about in terms of the environment, human rights, those kind of values, and really approach these conversations as a skeptic. You know, how would someone view this conversation? Would they view it as greenwashing? Would they have other questions about Bitcoin and the environment and things like that? So you hear me doing that a little bit in this episode uh, and with other episodes coming up in the future as well. But thank you as always to everyone for listening, for sharing, for supporting our show uh, and, and all of those things. I really, really appreciate it. And be sure to like and subscribe to all of our channels if you haven't done so already. And like I said, share far and wide with friends who really need to hear uh, the message that Bitcoin is for everyone. Bitcoin is for human rights, pro-environment and, and those kind of things. So anyway, I'll let you all get to this great conversation with Kent and we'll see you all again next week. Hey Kent, and welcome to the Progressive Bitcoiner. How are you? I'm excellent. Thanks for having me, Trey. Yeah, thanks for, thanks for coming on. I'm, I'm excited for this conversation. Been a long time coming folks will know you know i'm a long time customer of saz um use you know talk about the promo code for people to get bitcoin miners through saz and all of that but this is going to be more of a wide covering a wide ranging conversation about bitcoin mining about environmentalism about how you got into bitcoin about energy you know a lot of the stuff that is is very misunderstood still um in in bitcoin in the world especially with progressive and left circles um so i'm excited to get into this conversation and put it out into the world and for people to hear or hear from you, uh, especially. But before we do that, I want to give folks a little introduction to you. So do you want to tell people, you know, who you are, a little bit about your background and uh, what you're up to now? Yeah. So um, kind of a wide ranging journey uh, to get to Bitcoin. Uh, and I won't go clear back through um, too deep of an analysis on who I am and how I got here. I, I will just say that I've just always had a, an emphasis on personally vision of harmonizing humanity uh, with the planet. And so that led me um, into a career in rooftop solar out of college. And then eventually from there, I took a couple years sabbatical um, and fell in love with a, both a Portuguese woman and Bitcoin. This was circa 2014, 2016. So restarted life for myself in 2016. Tried my hand at a couple entrepreneurial activities there in Portugal. Getting a life started both personally and professionally again was a challenge in a new locale, new language, all that. And came across Jeff Boost, The Price of Tomorrow, and I think it was circa 2019 uh, or early 2020, gave that a read and just had this aha moment where I realized, oh my gosh, the cost curves of solar are going to intersect with Bitcoin mining at some point in the not so distant future. And my passion for Bitcoin uh, combined with my former passion for solar could collide, like that's where I need to be. And so I uh, heard Will, the founder of SAS Mining, talking on a solar podcast 
uh, I reached out to the host who I happened to know and asked for an introduction and came on board to SAS Mining uh, in January of 2021, uh, helped Will raise some capital um, for a completely different direction. Will was thinking the company should go and it wasn't enough. It was for a couple of shovel ready mining projects and uh, we had a good think about it. Will and Will came up with the idea of, hey, why don't we build this web application that makes it easy for people to mine kind of in the same way that uh, Uber came along and unlocked the ride sharing service. Like, why don't we do that for Bitcoin mining and make native Bitcoin acquisition, um, you know, attempt to make that the default way that people acquire their Bitcoin. And so that's what we've been doing ever since, um, you know, basically October 2021 is pursuing that mission. Now we've got a couple of sites, uh, one in the U.S. and Wisconsin and another in Paraguay that are almost, uh, at, I mean, the one in Wisconsin's at capacity and we're about at capacity in Paraguay. So really happy with our our, uh, our progress and, and mining only on excess hydropower is a pretty delightful uh, position morally to be in too. Yeah, and I know I will highly recommend folks, um, you know, listen to our other episodes. We could do a deep dive into Bitcoin mining. There's so much always to talk about and learn about. We've done that on a few episodes recently and always, always more to do. There's so many books and topics that explore that as well. So so really for this conversation or for our audience to know, you know, we're going to focus a little bit on some nuts and bolts of of your, your, your Bitcoin business. I say, I think some thoughts about where the narrative is at about Bitcoin mining and a service like yours, right? Because there's two, I, I don't want to speak for you, but I think there's two narratives that that folks like yourself might combat, right? There's the one of, Bitcoin crypto business, right? There's been a lot of scams in the crypto Bitcoin space. More about the company, not about Bitcoin itself as an as a underlying asset or Bitcoin mining, right? That is very open, that is very easy to see and, and um, a little bit more challenging maybe to understand. But there's been cloud mining companies before, there's been crypto companies that have come and gone. And then also Bitcoin mining. There's been a lot of environmental narratives that we're combating around uh, you know, Bitcoin mining about how it's really harmful for the environment and about how much energy it uses and that, you know, it's refiring up coal plants across the planet and, and it's going to warm our planet far past any other industry, you know, all of these different things. So, so for you starting off, I think jumping into Bitcoin from, from solar, um, what made you really intrigued? You alluded to a little bit, but what made you really intrigued about taking that leap from solar into Bitcoin mining and what was there for you in a little more detail about about energy and made you so intrigued to to do this and, and go forward with something like SAS mining? So it's fascinating. Um, you know, the the connection for me was actually quite obvious by about like 2019, 2020, that that Bitcoin was going to be this transformative technology um, in a dramatic way. And while I've always thought that the grid transformation and the energy transformation side of things that Bitcoin is pursuing is interesting, and that's where I'm putting you know my life force and my focus in building SAS mining here, I actually think that the the bigger impact um, will come from the changing of individuals' time horizons that adopt Bitcoin. And I say this from having observed the behavior of individuals as they adopt Bitcoin. And without exception, every single individual that I've seen that has come to fully grok Bitcoin, their time horizons have shifted and they start to think in longer term and they start to focus on saving uh, Bitcoin. And saving Bitcoin uh, means to defer purchase decisions into the future. And so what I see is in the aggregate, as Bitcoin adoption goes up, humanity's consumption is going to go down. And consumption I see is actually the biggest driver of our uh, disharmony, let's say, with the planet. So the consumption side of the equation actually inspires me a lot more than the, the energy side. But the energy side is a fascinating aspect of Bitcoin. And just knowing that we've got this load that can be uh, put on. So by load, I mean, uh, you know, an energy uh, harnessing or consumptive device called mining that can be positioned anywhere on the planet uh, to consume power that would other by, otherwise be wasted or discarded um, means that there's suddenly a buyer anywhere uh, for uh, both first and last resort uh, for energy supplies. And that that's sort of like a, a new um, 
economic substrate. I, I think, Kent, when you talk about the consumerism angle and the the spending angle and the time preference angle of Bitcoin, I think that's one thing that not a lot of people outside of Bitcoin would fully understand, kind of the time horizon and deflationary aspect of of Bitcoin. So for you, can you elaborate a bit more on, okay, people get Bitcoin, they want to save more. Can you talk a bit more just about that deflationary aspect of Bitcoin? Because not only are we talking about ways in which Bitcoin can be quite beneficial for the environment on the Bitcoin mining side, but what it does to consumerism and just our psyche in, in so many ways in societies and what that could look like. Yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's not apparent. You're right. Uh, at first, what, what I just described, um, it, it can't, it's sort of a realization that dawned on me after several years in the space, and I was noticing how my behavior was changing. And it came down to a very simple fact. Like I had become convinced after reading and researching and listening to many, many people talking about Bitcoin, that this wasn't going away. This was the next evolution in monetary technology. And every other time there had been a better form of money, humanity had shifted to that better form of money because it represented a an improved uh, technology. And so seeing that, it, it seemed inevitable that Bitcoin's adoption would occur. And believing that, that meant that the price was going to go up. And so the, the next um, conclusion that a person reaches in that line of thinking is, okay, if my purchasing power is going up, that means everything that I use my Bitcoin for today to purchase, I could maybe have purchased more of that thing in the future. And so every purchase decision then becomes a sort of fight with yourself when it comes to Bitcoin. Am I going to spend my Bitcoin today or am I going to save it because I will be able to purchase more with it in the future? And so you begin to have discussions between your present self and your future self as to what makes the most sense. And I just think it's a difference in savings technology uh, and the fact that the number is going up. Uh, over time that drives that change in individual behavior. And again, as I mentioned, every Bitcoiner that I've seen sort of wrestles with that same choice. Uh, and in the aggregate, you put all the individuals together, and that means there will be societal level shifts in terms of how we function and behave uh, once Bitcoin's adoption increases to a larger percentage of the populace. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to play devil's advocate a little bit and, and push back on that because I think Sure. You know, some what this is kind of a separate conversation that we won't necessarily do, but but obviously you and I know there are a lot of economists and a lot of folks that talk about the necessity of inflation, that society will collapse if we operated at a large scale in the way that you're discussing, or that it creates this potential hoarding mentality. I can imagine someone who's who's not in Bitcoin hearing this. Well, that just will make people feel really greedy and and want to just hoard and not support people, support communities. So I'm curious your take on that. How would you respond to someone that says, um, you know, a little bit tidbit on like how society would operate and what it does to the individual in terms of a hoarding mentality of some were to think of that? Because I've gotten that a lot before when talking about, you know, Bitcoin and its savings technology. Well, I think, first of all, I think I've come to uh, see the word hoarding as being, uh, uh, coming with a lot of emotional baggage. Um, I, I think, you know, uh, squirrels hoard their acorns for the winter, right? And we don't typically apply a, a judgmental bias on that. But when we talk about it with one another, we do, right? So I think I think that it's good to acknowledge uh, that there's a judgmental factor that comes on hoarding. Uh, but what I see uh, savings as is more of stored uh, production, right? So you've done work and you've stored that uh, production uh, that excess production that you have uh, accomplished for the future uh, to consume and spend. And when I look back at um, at his, history, when there's been a harder money standard in place, and, and maybe it's my own bias in coming from where I did in a smaller community, but I, I could see the knock-on impacts of, um, of life under a gold standard where there was stronger community in place and people would help one another uh, individually because they knew each other and people were wanting to get along. I think that we've abrogated 
our responsibility to one another uh, in uh, most of Western society and given that responsibility to the government at this point. And I think a hard money standard uh, because the government doesn't have seniorage at that point, the ability to print the money um, to be able to fund these types of programs that often are abused and, and you know, the money gets drained away and not actually to the target individuals that are trying to be helped. But I think that that goes away and becomes a lot more decentralized as individual community groups and, and the people that are producing in excess um, look around them and say, hey, we're all in this together. Let's help one another out. Uh, and that's what I experienced a little bit more. And I know it's kind of where my parents came from a bit more coming coming through the pre-fiat uh, era uh, in their lives. Um, so that's that's my sense as we go back to, I, I like to think of it more as ancestral wisdom uh, more than anything. Yeah, and I, I think even for myself, just in terms of a very practical with any sort of use of Bitcoin, when you do, when you do use it, um, because again, Bitcoin doesn't, how do I say this? I wouldn't say Bitcoin makes someone a, a good or bad person, right? Like you were saying, we're attaching a lot of words to hoarding mentality and things like that. Um, Bitcoin in a, in, a, in a book coming out in the next few months, Resistance Money, which we'll, we'll talk to the team about, about that. I was lucky to get an advanced copy and, and read some of this. Some of the first line is Bitcoin is for, for enemies. Bitcoin is for you know, dictators, Bitcoin is for that. It's also for <laughs> human rights ag- advocates. It's for the worker trying to save money. It is a, we're, we're talking about neutral tools, a, a neutral technology, and we're assigning value to it based on different human emotions, like you mentioned, different people, right? So there are going to be people, they're really great people using Bitcoin in really great ra- ways as a value exchange, because that's what it is. It's a, in that regard, it's a neutral technology. So I'll say for me, whenever I have sent someone sats or, or Bitcoin, it feels like the most meaningful transfer because for me, Bitcoin is that thing that's not going to get inflated away. It is that thing, which is a new parallel system. It is like you are handing over this, this new digital gold in a way. So you're telling someone, I value you this much that I'm going to support your, your art in this way or this coffee shop that accepts Bitcoin. I'm going to make sure to do that or buying merch that, that it accepts Bitcoin, or are you all at size mining, you know, you're able to purchase miners with Bitcoin and mine Bitcoin, you know, the, all of this stuff. It's just really cool, but it also feels like I am, I am opting into that. So it's this um, rewarding someone with like the ultimate value for me is what it feels like when I spend Bitcoin and then, and then replace it, right? E- exit out of your, your dollars, your, your fiat into, back into Bitcoin. That's, that's my philosophy around it. Um, but I couldn't agree more. We, we attach a lot of a lot of meaning on some of these things. And um, I guess it all goes back to politicking in some way and, and assigning value, which um, I've always seen you kind of ri- rise above that in a way, which you have said to me before, it probably goes back to your time outside of the US as well. And a lot of these conversations we've had, you've been outside of uh, the context of the US for quite a bit when thinking through these things. Yeah, you know, um, I, I have been outside the U.S. I, I kind of I think of myself as having a foot in both realities at this point. Um, you know, it's been about a decade now that I've lived outside the U.S. and been very grateful for it, uh, and and left you know relatively at a relatively uh, high point, let's say, in the U.S. culture of 2014, and um, you know have the value set that I generated at that point as an American and still think very highly and have those sort of classic uh, liberal founding father sort of ideals by which I, I, I view the, the U S and its potential. Um, and I think it's through that lens that ultimately I wound up in solar and found that there's a very parallel experience to what you were just describing about sending sats to somebody, which is I would go out to somebody's home that uh, we had installed the solar system on. I'd help them turn off and energize their solar electric system. And they would begin to see their meter spin backwards and produce their own electricity without any reliance on the grid. And there would be this light up moment. And I see a very similar light up moment with individuals when I send them sats, uh, where they suddenly realize, oh, you mean this thing that I've been fully dependent on my whole life? 
there's an option and I can be outside of that option. Uh, it's like a sense of liberation and breaking of the chains that they didn't even know were, were there. Uh, and, you know, for me, that's a very um, palpable moment that I, I, I truly enjoy sharing with individuals for their first time. But I would say that it's not, um, it, it doesn't come easy because of all the baggage that we have around words. So actually, I think there's much more baggage around the word Bitcoin at this point uh, than, than uh, anything else. In fact, we were just both commenting, you know, before we got started here about somebody that obviously was very triggered by a sign that said Bitcoin is for everyone, uh, that uh, some individual uh, stepped onto this person's yard, took the sign and walked off down the street with it, which is, I mean, if if words trigger that much to where theft is going to happen, my, my gosh, but we've gotten to a very interesting spot with a word for that to occur. Yeah, it, it almost was viewed as like, okay, uh, a sign for a politician that pers- doesn't, person doesn't like, let's take that down, or a sign for a, for a cause that that person doesn't like, or or a hate speech element, like, let's take that out, right? For 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 Bitcoin. And oh gosh, there's so many different points you can look at as to how we got here with that. Um, there, there's a lot of reasons. There's a lot of, a lot of bad actors that have attributed to that. There's a lot of Silliness from the left progressive camp that I try to talk to a lot about these preconceived notions or about hearing one little thing and then ass- assuming and, and holding so fixed to that reality. Um, but it's just gosh, that's unfortunate. It, it's so crazy. And yeah, before jumping on with you, I, I was like, in this election year, because um, I've heard a lot of people say this, and I do agree, like, like Bitcoin is not and should not be a partisan issue. Uh, but in some regards, it, it still is, right? I am looking forward to the day when we get over that curve to where we're talking about Bitcoin and it's kind of everywhere. You don't think about it as much. It's like the internet. There are different types of people on the internet that use the internet. That wasn't always the case. Uh, the internet, and I've said it so many times on here, people are probably sick of it, but there were very famous court cases and, and the internet was thought to only be used by criminals and bad people and actors and a certain type of person used the internet well that's that's silliness to think of now and i'm looking forward to the day when we get there with with bitcoin yeah you you know i am too and you know i think back in i I was very much influenced by reading the sovereign individual um you know one of many books that has influenced my understanding of bitcoin and it's not even a book about bitcoin it was written in the 90s about um basically technologies that have shifted the trajectory of society. And they call these macro political forces and the stir up might be, uh, is one, uh, which sounds odd, but in medieval era, the stir up when it came along allowed knights to be on horses. And suddenly the technological advantage of a knight being on a horse was enough to actually uh, transform the protection needed for uh, individual villages and just radically shifted entire societal landscape and you know gunpowder is a could be seen it was thought of as a medicine uh and then we started to use it for projectiles uh and so you could see it as a neutral technology that became weaponized right um and shifted all of society uh, and and suddenly distributed uh guns um you know and arguably that's the reason why the u.s was able to separate from um the UK, uh, and, and Britain. And so, you know, I, I do think that Bitcoin is a neutral technology. Um, however, I do think that it has knock on political or not even political, but societal implications and the incumbent power system that exists is always going to resist a disruptive force. And to me, that's almost just like a natural law. It occurs. It doesn't matter what incumbent system we're talking about. And, you know, Bitcoin is a disruptive monetary force. And frankly, I don't think that any of the incumbent monetary system suspected that there was a disruption on the horizon and sort of caught them off guard uh, that this is even here and now. And thankfully, you know, uh, the network has uh, proven resilient and grown through Bitcoin mining such that it now looks like it would be impossible for a state actor to actually thwart this network 
Uh, and so it's, yeah, it's very unique how this circumstance even came to be. But I think the more that it grows, the more that it is a threat to the incumbent financial system. And then the messaging and the politics that come out from that uh, is a lot of what we're experiencing is, you know, people taking their favorite leader and what they're saying and just running with those ideas without doing the thought themselves. That is the hard thing with Bitcoin is, you know, you have to do the work. Uh, to get it. Like you really can't listen to other people. You can listen to their ideas, but until you research it yourself and, and understand it, like you can't really get your head wrapped around it and you can't get the conviction necessary to stay the course. Otherwise you'll, uh, you'll have weak hands, so to speak. You'll, you, you'll buy your Bitcoin without conviction. And then the first uh, 30% drop, you'll be out, out the exit. Um, that happens to a lot of people I've, I've experienced and tried to help on board, uh, unfortunately. So I don't, I don't generally tend to push Bitcoin in the same way anymore as a result. Yeah, I've definitely come full circle on, you know, in terms of Bitcoin preaching, Bitcoin adoption. I think everyone who really gets into Bitcoin feels they have a role to play. I'm sure you feel like you have many roles to play, including one as an entrepreneur. For me, it's kind of like putting out content and having it accessible having it present, having it try to be in as many places as possible and having people when they are ready, access that. Um, I don't like being preached at or spoken at about you should do this, you should do that. So my assumption is that other people, there are very few, maybe five to 10% will really take well to like, you should buy Bitcoin right now, you should do it. It is the greatest thing ever invented on planet earth. Sometimes it sounds a bit scammy when we talk that way. Other times someone will do just like you said and they'll buy it. And then something will happen, some geopolitical event or some uh, something will make investors fearful and they sell Bitcoin and then the price crashes and they're like, gosh, then they'll say this is a scam, even though price crashing is not the same as a scam, but it's a whole other conversation. So yeah, I, I for a while now, I think a lot of uh, the people I respect most in the community, and I think most in the community are saying, go out there and learn Bitcoin, like learn it for yourself, like what appeals to you as an individual or your family or your your context, whether in your, you're in Namibia, whether you're in China, whether you're here in the US, whether you're in you know, Latin America, there's different ways that it's going to appeal to you. So, so figure out what your appeal is. For me, it was human rights. For me, it was Alex Gladstein. Um, and for me, it was hearing the Trojan horse case. Uh, when I had given up on solutions in the world, I'm just like, well, corporations are going to do their thing. Governments are going to do their thing. I'm not sure what we're looking at here. But then hearing Alex talk about that power struggle that you were describing, that, man, Bitcoin does great things in his words for the little guy, right? Like, like Bitcoin is very empowering for the little guy. I was like, oh, okay, I, I get it now. Uh, I get it now. And also, okay, yeah, nice in a retirement account, but oh, wow, this other thing is very cool. So for me, that was, like I said, that was kind of really enlightening for me and learning about Bitcoin. And I think that's my hope for other progressives and left-leaning folk. And, and, and listen, when we do episodes, for me, it's, it's less about this episode is for, you know, XYZ person and XYZ political party. I think it's accessible content to, to everyone, but, but I know the, the FUD and the narratives that are there. So for me, it's that kind of calling and longing to do our part to talk to those people because they might, might listen to us a little bit more than someone else, which is silly, but, but it is, it is the way it is currently. And so in this, in this narrative, obviously, another huge part that we focus on is the environmental impact of mining, which I wanted to make sure to talk with, with you on. We, we alluded to, you know, renewable energy through excess hydropower, things like that. So to, to ask you a bit of a loaded question, and you can take it where you'd like, um, you know, is Bitcoin mining beneficial or, or helpful at all to, to the environment? Or is it more greenwashing, which, which I've heard some say about folks that say of the environmental benefits to Bitcoin mining? How do you approach that question if someone says, oh, you all at SAS Mining are just, are just greenwashing because you want people to buy your miners or you want um, Bitcoin to go up in price. You want people to utilize your crypto more than, more than another. How, do you, how would you respond to those people? Well, I, what I found is generally if people are entrenched in a specific position, then as much as I like to, and I still do it anyway, from time to time, as much as I like to, what, I, what I've discovered is asking questions is actually the best approach. Uh, and so I'll just try to back up a step. And, you know, I, I, what you were talking about earlier of, of uh, encouraging people to learn about Bitcoin, 
that's basically where I try to get people pointed is to be curious, to start their own learning journey. And I do encourage people to buy a small amount, say 50 bucks worth, just so they've got some skin in the game and it'll keep their attention. I do think a small amount of Bitcoin is good for um, keeping focused. But, uh, you know, somebody that approaches me with that type of ideology, I want to know where they came from. Um, why, why do they think that? Um, and then, and then from there I can insert some facts like, Hey, you know, it's, it's, uh, renewably powered 56% of the, of the network is renewably powered, which is more than any industry on the planet. You know, it uses a fifth, the amount of power is the banking sector, um, you know, which is arguably the, the force that it's disrupting, you know, so try to insert some very simple facts that can cause them to just want to, um, re rethink and learn a bit more about their position. But, you know, the, the, uh, the other side of me is just basically wants to shut them down and just tell them like, look, you're, you're utterly uh, deluded. And I'm sorry that you think that because once you dig in and learn about uh, this and see all the good that's occurring and the simple fact of, of the alignment of incentives, you know, having uh, worked uh, for part of my career uh, overseeing a sales organization and writing compensation plans, I've just really it got it drilled into me how much people are beholden to incentives. And if you look at the incentives for mining, it is to find the lowest cost power uh, to mine the most profitable Bitcoin. And the lowest cost power is the power that nobody wants. And the power that nobody wants is the power that's either created at the wrong time or in the wrong location. And that happens to be a lot of renewable energy power. Um, and so as a result, the Bitcoin miners are just going to wind up flocking to renewable energy without anything having to be done, without any moral argument having to be done. And, and in fact, I would argue that's what most of the makeup of the network is. And we're able to tell a very green narrative about it, but it's really comes down to simply alignment of incentives. And that understanding of alignment of incentives is, um, I guess, quite difficult for people to to realize. And so I, I, I will admit I'm, I'm human too, right? Like there is a part of me that when somebody comes, comes at me uh, with what I'm doing uh, with these sort of uh, biases, there's a part of me that just, you know, kind of want to punk them and just basically tell them, hey, you're kind of dumb because you just haven't looked into this yet. And you're regurgitating points that you've read uh, or seen somebody else say without having done your own research. Because once you do and just see this, this clear alignment of incentives uh, where Bitcoin mining uh, looks for the lowest cost power and, you know, the power that is discarded and wasted is the cheapest power. And that just happens to be the power that that is produced at the wrong time or the wrong location, um, and that's renewable, well, it's pretty clear that Bitcoin mining is going to gravitate toward renewable, clean energy sources over time. Uh, that's just reality. Whether we want to put any moral judgment on that or not, uh, the incentives just align. And as soon as you see that, it's really obvious how Bitcoin is good for uh, the environment because it is monetizing something that is either uh, underutilized or frankly wasted. Uh, and that I think is hard for people to understand in the same way that it's also just hard for people to understand electricity. Uh, I've had to come to accept that in general, like the fact that electricity is a flow and a force that has to be used or lost uh, is very difficult for people to understand. Um, and, you know, as we're used to goods that you can save and uh, maybe they'll spoil eventually, but you can save them for quite some time. Electricity is not one of those uh, commodities. It's a use it or lose it. And, and that simple understanding is, is, is lost on most people. And I get it. You can't see it. You can only see the effects of it. Uh, so it does make sense why people would have that struggle, but yeah, it's, uh, uh, basically, that argument uh, for against Bitcoin mining is, is is comes down from my perspective to to ignorance, even though that's not how I respond to it when somebody brings it up. Hi, everyone. Hope you're enjoying the episode. Today's episode is brought to you by Bitbox. Now, Bitbox is a hardware wallet that's open source, incredibly secure and easy to use. And it's what I'm using to safely secure my Bitcoin in cold storage. Now, I know self-custodying Bitcoin can really be intimidating, but Bitbox is designed for ease of use without compromising on security. It's USB-C compatible and allows you to easily back up and restore your private keys with a micro SD card, which is really cool. 
Now you can purchase the BitBox using the promo code TPB at the link found in the show notes for 5% off your purchase. And I really want to thank BitBox for their support of the podcast. All right, I'll let you get back to the episode now. Yeah, and it, you know, in a way too, because that, that's a totally human response. I think sometimes it can be hard because there's more and more, you know, I, I got into Bitcoin not that long ago. I've said a million times on the show, like early 2021. And, you know, the past two, three years in the space, there's been so many environmental, beneficial, easy to digest at a surface level understanding of when we say Bitcoin is good for the environment, what do we mean? Talking about grid balancing, talking about renewable energy input, talking about mitigating methane into carbon dioxide, which is less harmful than methane. So those three points right there, there's a dozen three-minute articles right now I can think of to send to people and then encourage them to follow along with, with Daniel Batten, with Troy Cross, with Marco Piaz to, to understand. For me, that was kind of enough initially hearing about those things. And then people can take deep dives into like, we had Harry Suttick on recently and he recommended this like monster, like energy book, um, you know, a, about how energy and civilization and very, uh, you know, in, in Harry fashion, which people can take a deeper dive into. But, you know, I think that's part of the thing. Like before I got into Bitcoin, I didn't know a thing about energy and markets. And I, I still, you know, I, there's always more I can learn, but started to get a better understanding of how grids actually work, how energy generation works, how we need to be using more energy, not less, if we're going to keep up with, with life and the way things are going. Um, and a technological force, which I, I know you completely agree with, that's really backwards to a lot of the narratives that progressives in the left and, and folks like myself would typically get from environmentalist groups, uh, from different um, you know, movements uh, in the environmental movement. So I understand on one part, their opposition when hearing things like that. But if your argument is, we need to use less energy and en any, in a, you know, use of energy that I don't agree with. So some people think Bitcoin is just not worth it. Um, it's hard to start a conversation there. So I, I, I do understand that point. And sometimes you shouldn't push it with those, with those folks. And honestly, those folks probably might not even be listening to the podcast because it has Bitcoin in, in the podcast title, right? So usually it's people that are secretly looking or they're start, they, they saw an article and they're like, huh, okay, maybe it's not all bad. Then they start listening and then they're ripe for, for taking the, you know, the, the launch from here into that. So I, I couldn't agree more with that. That's right. People, people, people get there at their own speed. I mean, that's, that's where, from my vantage point, I look at Bitcoin and, you know, I, I see that Satoshi Nakamoto, he, he created this system that ultimately harnesses human self-interest. Every actor that participates with the Bitcoin network is doing so and, and can follow their own self-interest, greedy impulses to the nth degree. And as long as they follow the rules of the, internet, of the network, it, it causes the network itself to thrive. And to me, that's really the core innovation of, of, um, of the Bitcoin network is harnessing human self-interest because I don't believe that there's a more powerful uh, force on the planet, social force on the planet than, than our self-interest. And seeing that makes leads me to believe that Bitcoin's adoption is inevitable. And uh, for it to occur in a timely manner, we do have to fight for it. All right. So we've we've talked about the environmental side. We've, we've solved everyone's questions on environmental concerns around, around Bitcoin, right? Uh, just kidding. People can, can learn more. There's plenty of resources, as we were saying. But the other side of this lovely FUD and misinformation environment we live in is sometimes people hear Bitcoin and they think, ah, that's kind of a scam. Wasn't that Sam Bankman fried Tom Brady, FTX, crypto? This business comes, this one falls, this one comes and goes. Some people have had experiences specifically with even cloud mining services and, and all of this. So you as an entrepreneur in this space, lead, leading SaaS mining, leading the, effort, leading the efforts there, you know, what kind of responsibility do you do you take when thinking about this? And I've talked to other miners about this, other people in the industry that it's kind of like, fortunately, unfortunately, this industry, our lovely industry of Bitcoin is going to be extra scrutinized, right? If any little thing is dropped, they'll be on you more, even more than any other industry right now. Maybe AI will be second and coming, you know, other things, right? But in terms of Bitcoin, there's extra scrutiny. I think there's a lot of people that care about the integrity of what they're doing because they think Bitcoin is so important. So they want to run integral operations. But, but I'm curious for you, you know, about how you approach that uh, with all of those, those facts and even the misinformation that exists about crypto and Bitcoin companies, things like that. 
yeah, it, it's difficult, you know, to, to, to just be uh, clear about it. You know, when, I had no idea how difficult it would be starting off on this particular venture. I just know, you know, living in Portugal at that point in time that I had uh, tried mining at home, didn't have a particularly successful experience with it. And I wanted to have access to it and I wanted it to be easy. And knowing that, and then knowing, having talked to too many people, this is, you know, circa 2017, 18, 19 about uh, Bitcoin. You know, one of the first things that people said when they discovered Bitcoin was, oh, I can go mine Bitcoin. And, and I knew that there's just this latent desire to, to access um, your own Bitcoin, do the work, generate your own Bitcoin. And so taking all that together and, and having the ethos of, of Bitcoin uh, and the community you know, as my backdrop, you know, really have shaped the SaaS mining platform to align incentives uh, to give people that experience as close to uh, having full control of uh, a mining experience with the ease of access as possible. What I mean by that is, you know, we've built this web application that's traditional e-commerce where you can come choose your own Bitcoin mining rig. Uh, and it takes us about a month to purchase that and get it shipped. Uh, from China to our site where it's deployed, our data center where it's deployed. And once it's deployed uh, or available on the rack space, at that point, we have our clients set up their service plan, uh, at which was uh, going to cover the cost of the power and maintenance. Um, and then Bitcoin mining rewards are starting to be generated directly to our clients' wallets. Now, the way we've de developed our business is actually uh, the economics are very, very simple. Uh, all the revenue we generate gets offset with the expenses to run the operation for our clients, with the exception of uh, a percentage of the uh, mining rewards. So we instruct the mining pool to split the payout uh, from the, the rewards generated from the mining rig so that we receive just 15% and our clients receive 85%. And so that means that we've got the exact same incentive our clients do. Uh, of keeping their mining rigs going as much as possible, uh, getting their their mining rigs repaired quickly. Because in essence, if our clients aren't generating Bitcoin, then we're not generating revenue for our business either. So having those fully aligned incentives, I think, has been a game changer and helps us make decisions uh, that are going to be positively impactful uh, for our clients' experience. So you combined a web application with that sort of aligned incentives and you know we look at ourselves as a mining as a service business which is very unique in this space um, and we will continue to refine that because having a web application allows us to to move things in different directions not just display the information on mining in a different way but also um, be able to uh, generate new client experiences um, you know whether that's financing that we're able to layer in performance guarantees, you know, there's a lot of different things on a roadmap in the future, but at the end of the day, it's, it's akin to uh, reality before Uber came along and having to hail a taxi cab if you want to mine right now versus going on, opening your Uber app and having a, uh, a taxi show up right in front of you and you jump in in the next five minutes and take off to your destination. Yeah. And I think too, that's, you know, one, one thing for me that you know, I, I liked about SaaS when looking into this is, I think, first of all, a lot of people coming into Bitcoin that consider themselves Bitcoins, it's don't trust verify. So you have a lot of people that are, uh, you know, going to scrutinize just based on that, which is, which is a good thing, I think. Um, but, it, but another is just, you know, rolling with the punches of this industry of, of getting into something like mining, I guess, in one part, it's kind of like, wow, are you crazy? Because, you know, part of it was, it was a bear market. Bitcoin mining is, is brutal in terms of finding low cost, you've got jurisdictional risk, you've got regulatory stuff that's always down the pike. You've got, is this taxation going to be opposed? Is this leader going to be in power? Is this country going to, you know, ban miners from the country? You know, we've got all these different risks so associated with it. So I guess part of me too, because um, I'm really fascinated by Bitcoin mining. I'm, I'm, you know, clearly a customer. I'd like to do lifelong mining. Um, you know, forever. I, I'm really obsessed with it, but a lot of us are, are kind of crazy for, for this type of field and environment, but it, but it is pretty cutting edge. It's a frontier type field to it. You know, mining the way it looks now 
hasn't been around that long, especially not public miners and, and things like that, or companies like, like SAS mining, you know, we're, we're talking six, seven years for some public miners, not even four years. Right. So w- when you take a look at all the, the risk and the regulatory stuff, um, how do you wade through that as a, as a leader, as a entrepreneur? I mean, there's a ton of people that come into Bitcoin as well that are, have like startup mentalities, right? I think that draws a lot of people maybe listening to this show or just others into Bitcoin. You know, what for you, how you approach that as just a, a business leader and entrepreneur in this field that some people are like, wow, you really want to go into that? That's, that's pretty tough. That's a pretty tough new risk. Um, I'm curious how you handle all that. Well, I, uh, this is going to sound odd, but I actually think of that environment as my normal because my entire career has been in that type of an environment. And so I say that coming from rooftop solar, which uh, anybody that works in that industry affectionately uh, refers to the solar industry as a solar coaster. And the reason why is for much the same reason as you just described is regulatory risks, like incentives will get put in place and you build the business model around that set of incentives and then local politics will change and then those incentives will go away and so now you've suddenly got a business model where the unit economics have completely shifted underneath your feet and how do you continue to survive generate revenue these sorts of things so it actually coming from the solar industry I don't think it's intuitive to most people, but there's a, an incredible number of parallels that I've been able to pull through into the Bitcoin mining sector. And one of those parallels is how do you manage all this regulatory risk? And and so I'm applying the same playbook, which is, hey, be diversified, right? And don't have all your eggs and your revenue being generated in one basket. And so for us, even at our early stage, you know, we, we uh, had our first uh, data center procured in Wisconsin and Second, we went to Paraguay. You know, we just wanted to be someplace where we thought we could uh, diversify away from. And this decision was made last year when, you know, the 30% tax on all uh, electricity used with Bitcoin mining was on the table. Texas had some legislation on the table. New York was had some legislation on the table. And Will and I at that point in time, Will the founder, we just both looked at it and said, you know, there's this great opportunity in Paraguay. Why don't we go there and just kind of avoid and, and let the dust settle. It seems like it'll settle okay, but you know we need to find clients that are going to be willing to come in and mine with us in a facility. And we need to find clients that uh, aren't going to be worried about those regulatory risks. And the alignment of incentives in Paraguay were really astounding. Uh, you know, just to touch on that briefly, there was a dam called the Atapu Dam that was built in the 70s and half the power is dedicated to Brazil and half to Paraguay because it goes across the border. Uh, this dam does dams of body water that, that makes up the border between the two countries. Well, seven gigawatts of power is a lot of power for Paraguay and they can't utilize it all. And so they only utilize about two to three gigawatts. And that's left all this excess electricity on their side of the arrangement that they've been selling at a loss to Brazil. Uh, and so Bitcoin miners are showing up there and able to start, uh, you know, harnessing that electricity uh, and bringing economic gain into the Paraguayan economy. And when I looked at that alignment of incentives, I just said, my gosh, the local politicians are going to embrace this because we're going to be bringing jobs and economic growth opportunity to their uh, country. And indeed, that's what's what's occurred, um, you know, and and, you know, read the tea leaves uh, correctly on that one. But, you know, there was there was hubbub about uh, six weeks ago uh, that the Paraguayan government, there was some officials that wanted to put a ban on uh, on Bitcoin mining. And instantly the uh, the economic ministry came out in support of it. Uh, there's now a proposal to make Bitcoin legal tender. So, you know, the action beget a much bigger reaction. And it seems like Things are moving forward in a very, very positive way for, for Paraguay as it relates to Bitcoin. So anyhow, um, all that is to say, you know, where we look at these incentives and these risks, and I think I think of them personally as par for the course in business because of my, my experience. But yeah, it, it makes it, a, I think, a unique personality that is willing to tackle those challenges. And I thankfully, I think most Bitcoiners are of that, that particular persuasion. Yeah. And, and I want to touch on one point you brought up too. That one thing that I've found really cool is some of Bitcoin's best moments. And by that, I mean, you know, Bitcoin companies, you know, just individuals with better rights or access to Bitcoin and being able to use it more freely and things like that. 
come out of some measures that are, are considered quite draconian or, or some things that seem negative in the moment, like the Paraguay situation. That was a, a maybe a week turnaround where there was so much feedback and so much facts about, whoa, 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 this is actually like going to bring more, more money and growth to the economy in Paraguay. Let's hold up. Let's, let's figure this out. But it kind of came in light of those measures from some representatives. So I thought that was really cool. It's like you, sometimes you, you bring that, um, you know, FUD, misinformation, whatever kind of fear about Bitcoin. And then immediately you take one step back, take two, three giant steps forward. So sometimes when FUD narratives come up, people are like, oh my gosh, this is terrible for the industry. This is terrible for Bitcoin. More times than not, um, it, it, it bends in a good way. For, for Bitcoin, which is really cool. And again, with, with facts on our side, this isn't bending in a way that's manipulative to Paraguay. It's actually, they're just like, we're going to make more money doing this with, yeah. with these, these Bitcoin miners. That, that was so cool to me. Yeah, it, it really was cool. Um, you know, to just, just see the numbers quantified as quickly as they were by the industry and just, you know, the industry basically just raise, raise their hand and say, hey, you know, Mr. Mr. Paraguayan government, do you, uh, do you guys really want to leave $200 million in tax revenue on the table? Because uh, that's what you're talking about doing is removing that from your economy. And a bunch of a bunch of folks that were in the the government said, "Yeah, we're actually seeing this money come into the coffers." So, um, hey, okay, if you guys want to shut this down, but you're kind of cutting off your nose to spite your face. <laughs> and, and so, you know, the politicians that were sort of in the middle and didn't understand what was going on were suddenly like, "Oh wow, um, uh, yeah, let's let's embrace this." And and you know, kind of back to an earlier comment, a uh, convert part of the conversation we were having, Trey, about those those incentives in Bitcoin and how it harnesses human self-interest. Like that's what I see even within like the incumbent financial system that Bitcoin is disrupting is there are individuals that make up that system and certain individuals are seeing that Bitcoin is this positive catalyst and they're going out and buying their own Bitcoin because they see that the number is likely to go up and they're wanting to make their own gain. Well, once they've done that, in a lot of ways, Bitcoin has co-opted them. And now they're no longer as strong a force in the incumbent system. And I think that that's what we just saw play out in Paraguay is that co-opting of the incumbent system because certain individual actors in it have seen the light of their own self-interest and are, are pushing back. So it's interesting how that adoption occurs within Bitcoin, but I find it fascinating and, and, and just part of the game theory that again, continues to make it uh, inevitable in my mind that Bitcoin will eventually succeed despite the setbacks along the way. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I've got, I've got one more question, one more kind of area bef before we jump off. Cause you know, you, you at Saz and, and you yourself talk a lot about how almost everyone might become a Bitcoin miner or, or mm. kind of get Bitcoin in that way. And that it's the best way to get your Bitcoin is through, you know, something like Saz mining through Saz mining rather than buying off of an exchange. Why do you think that's your, your message to people when, when thinking about how to, how to get Bitcoin and for the long run, how to, how to hold Bitcoin as things might get tricky and dicey with these, you know, the, the issuance of, of new Bitcoin and more people looking to gobble up Bitcoin as, as funds continue to open, ETFs continue to open. It could get really interesting. So I'm, I'm, I'm curious your thoughts there for our audience. Oh, yeah. Well, you've, you, you definitely have encouraged me to jump up on my soapbox now. So admittedly, this is, this is a, a self, a self-serving, right, to, to share this, but something I truly believe, which is that you can see the Bitcoin is disappearing off of exchanges. And my belief is that that's occurring because Gresham's Law is at play which you know, is, is a law that says that people hoard good money and spend bad money. And from my perception, there is enough money floating around off, out there that eventually all the Bitcoin is going to uh, disappear from exchanges. Even, even as the price goes up, there's going to become a point in time where people don't want to sell for fiat. They'd rather continue to hold Bitcoin. And so assuming we hit this reality where there's no more Bitcoin left on exchanges, and we can see that that trend line is continuing to, to, to um, head towards zero right now over a seven, several year trajectory. If we do hit zero, how do people acquire their Bitcoin? And there's basically only two routes at that point. Uh, you can either sell goods and services to people that have Bitcoin or are willing to part with it for those goods and services, or you can mine it. And right now, mining Bitcoin is largely inaccessible. 
And so a platform like SAS Mining or what, with our web application is one of the few ways that people can access uh, Bitcoin in a completely different way that is, that is independent and circumvents the entire exchange process. And I think it's at this point, I think it's wise to diversify acquisition strategies. So a lot of people look for diversity amongst crypto assets when they first come in. And I actually think that that's the wrong approach. I think that there should be a diversity of Bitcoin acquisition strategies uh, in play. And I think mining should be a part of that. And the reason why is you have a completely different set of counterparty risks. So there's no KYC information necessary to buy a piece of hardware and to have it serviced by a, a, a business like ours. Um, and uh, you are purchasing a piece of hardware and you're getting a return for that piece of hardware in Bitcoin. So you're cycling your fiat into uh, hardware and paying service fees to collect Bitcoin on the back end. So it's much more like a dollar cost averaging. Uh, approach to acquiring your Bitcoin rather than to go to an exchange and see the Bitcoin price volatility and hit the big green buy button and then watch the price drop and and sort of have a, a heart in your mouth sort of moment where you're like, wow, did I did I did I do the right thing by buying my Bitcoin right now? Like you you completely sidestep all of that by mining uh, your own Bitcoin. So the counterparty risks are different. Um, you know, you are able to do it in a more private fashion. Uh, because there's no identity information needed to sell what in essence is a server and to sell maintenance on that server. And you're able to avoid uh, the price volatility risk in your acquisition strategy. So for all those reasons, I think it should be part of everybody's um, acquisition strategy is to mine. And then frankly, the biggest driver of demand for our business is when you run the numbers, it's just a a, a lower cost to acquire your Bitcoin through mining than it is to go to an exchange and buy it. And that single fact is is genuine, genuinely why we're able to run our business without really much of a marketing department, just a social media presence. Yeah. And I, I, you know, one of the things I'd encourage people to do is, you know, yeah, we have a, you know, we have a promo link in our show notes and things like that for people to get, get money off the miners. But, you know, one thing is, is Kent and his team is really receptive. If you have questions, if you have, you know, different things you want to understand and learn about SAS mining before jumping in, right? Because some of the costs initially, like the cost of a miner, the cost of electricity seem overwhelming. I think the website First of all, it's really easy to use. That's what made me want to jump in to begin with, right? In terms and condition, all this is very transparent for folks to see. Um, and you'll see kind of the calculation of, you know, when it's arguably going to be paid over time, like, you know, how much time it'll take and things like that. But I think we're just at the cusp, just what you're saying, Kent, there's going to be a point in time where people are going to be really pissed at some point. Like, how do I access Bitcoin mining because I can't get Bitcoin on exchanges or it's really challenging or it's more limited to okay, you can buy $1,000 this month or something, right? There will come a point in time. We, it could be five years from now, could be a year from now, it could be 50 years from now, right? But at some point, and this is kind of the game theoretics of, of Bitcoin, it's gonna get, it's gonna get interesting. Uh, and it doesn't hurt to, to look into Bitcoin mining. And, and for me, it was easy enough to do with, with SaaS because a lot of people in retail setting or um, you know, their home settings, residential settings, electricity is too expensive, right? At this moment in time uh, for, for Bitcoin mining to, to make sense. So for me, you know, as a customer, you guys have been killing it. You, you know that, um, you know, going through a lot of different stuff, uh, re been really interesting to, cool and see, to see the, uh, you know, the, the leadership develop there and the company in general. So super proud of all of that and, you know, happy to support how we can. But, you know, before we jump off, do you want to send anybody anywhere? Obviously, you know, your, your website, different ways to connect with you if folks want to connect. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm on uh, Twitter, or do we call it X now? Uh, at K Halliburton. Um, sasmining.com. We've got, you know, chat options there. You can chat live with, uh, some of our, uh, customer success associates. Um, and, you know, just reach out, learn more, uh, the same way that you learned about Bitcoin. Like I'd encourage you to learn about mining in general as an acquisition strategy. I mean, there's a reason why bankers are calling up the publicly traded mining companies and looking for Bitcoin, right? It's just, this is where the liquidity for the entire ecosystem is generated. And in my opinion, it is the substrate for not just the entire Bitcoin ecosystem, but I actually think it's a substrate for the entire crypto ecosystem as well. Just this day in, day out generation of blocks that miners create and the rewards that are driven for it 
is, is the stable engine of, uh, from a business standpoint, of the entire ecosystem. And I think the gravity of that is going to draw more and more people in. And, you know, that's how I got here. And I think that there's going to be a lot more, if not everybody, um, drawn into the, the orbit of mining uh, over the coming years. And, you know, I'm happy to welcome people into that as, as much as I'm able. And, you know, we continue to work on education and resources because I get it. It's not totally intuitive. Uh, how proof of work uh, exists and works and transforms electricity into Bitcoin. But, you know, it's a critical function for the network. And as a Bitcoiner, I love seeing the social layer that we're developing through SAS mining come together because I, even our clients, they get involved. Some of them don't understand mining. And the longer they're involved, the more it's like, oh, OK, I've got the incentives uh, and those incentives are driving me to actually understand this in a deeper, more compelling way. So it's like we're on this learning journey together. We've got a VIP Telegram group where you can see people learning on the fly. And it's it's really cool to see how people, where people are with their, their stage of the journey. Yeah. So anyway, long-winded response to all that, Trey, is just to say, hey, jump on in. The the, the water's fine. Um, you're you're going you're gonna to love the experience with mining, whether you choose to do it now or a few years, but um, just know that it's it's probably in, on the horizon for you to become a miner. Yeah, I'd agree. And I, I think the facts speak for, for themselves uh, with this. But thank you so much, Kent, for this this conversation. Um, you know, I know we'll be we'll be talking soon. And everyone check out check out SAS mining, learn more about Bitcoin mining. We've got a lot of other shows and resources that talk about it. Um, there's more and more articles coming out about it. So it's definitely an exciting time to learn more about it. But thank you so much, Kent, for, for jumping on. Thank you.